Well, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure to, on behalf of the Washington and Lee University Music Department and Tim Gaylard and all of the alumni and alumni of the University Chorus and Chamber Singers and Glee Club, we want to welcome you to the first annual... <laughs> Gordon P. Spice Retirement Concert and Cocktail Party. <laughs> it's no secret that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for all of us to pool our gifts and talents together, maybe sing in Latin one more time, maybe hit a few of the high notes, and I think most importantly, it's a great chance to sell the last few shrink-wrapped vinyl copies of A Roven with the Washington and League Glee Club. <laughs> Somehow I got overlooked by the Grammy nominating committee uh, in 1985. I think it is right and proper that we are at Wilson Hall this evening uh, to honor Gordon Spice um, because and although some of us of a certain age uh, may miss that, uh, that particular reverb that you would get from cinder block walls in DuPont Hall. Um, but we, it's, it's wonderful to be here at Wilson Hall. As you know, John Wilson is a great lover of music and a particular fan of Gordon Spice. And when I was a student here, he spoke often of the fact that Washington and Lee has a guardian angel that will appear at critical moments in our school's history and make sure that we get the right person at the right time for the right job. And Gordon, I don't think there's any question in anybody's hearts here tonight that in 1973, when there was an opening for a core director here at Washington and Lee, that that guardian angel made sure that we got the right person at the right time for the right job. Because here we are, it's 39 years later, and you have students from five decades who have gathered here to celebrate with you tonight and to sing with you tonight. Everyone from your very first class in 1974 up to my own son who just took your music history class in 2012. And I think most significantly, we have the, the largest class represented here tonight is the class of 1989. <laughs> Of course, the class of 1989 was the, it was the first class where Washington and Lee admitted women, and under your leadership, they really have transformed the choral program here at WNL. So we're glad that they're all here as well. So Gordon, this is your night. We're all here for you. And as you look around the room, I hope you believe in angels now. As the only member of Southern Comfort that actually had no solos but only speaking parts, I think it's appropriate that I should be the one to do the voiceover for this little retrospective on Doc. Gordon Spice was hired by Washington and Lee University in 1973 to teach music history, music appreciation, teach voice, and direct the Glee Club. Even as a young man, he was already sharing his ready smile. Quickly, he raised the standards of singing in the Glee Club and took them on tours to places such as Puerto Rico in 1974. Gordon, during these years at WNL, could be seen at many football games. Here, he's in the company of his sons, Reed and Baby Graham. Already his son Reed was showing interest in music by coming to the Glee Club rehearsals. And very quickly, Doc established a pattern of taking the Glee Club on international tours in even-numbered years, alternating with domestic tours in the odd-numbered years. Here's a happy Glee Club on a successful tour of Jamaica in 1976. One of the secrets of his choral conducting success was his intense focus on the music and the students. A domestic tour to New York City in 1977 included this irreverent trip to St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. Then the first international tour across the ocean in 1980 to England included an impromptu performance by the Glee Club in the historic and resonant Westminster Abbey. Doc always managed to stay organized and keep his cool 
even through all the vagaries of international travel, all the different languages, lost passports, and all the things that could go wrong with so many people on a trip. In 1982, a very large and popular glee club visited Germany, ably assisted by Bob Youngblood, Gordon's colleague in the German department. There would be many similar trips to Germanic lands in the future. In 1984, followed another international trip to England, this time also including Wales, and the place my family lived near Hexton and Hitchin in England. Of course, Gordon was not just the director of the Glee Club, but also an advisor to a highly popular a cappella group known as Southern Comfort. One of the regular highlights for SoCo was their stint during the Christmas break at the Greenbrier Hotel. There, they entertained the guests with their music and a lot of their antics. On those occasions, Gordon was also at the hotel to make sure everyone performed well and maintained their reputations as fine W&L gentlemen. Occasionally, W&L celebrities such as Jim and Celeste Whitehead were guests at the hotel and expressed their delight and appreciation of SoCo's efforts. SoCo was often featured on Glee Club tours to provide lighter entertainment. Here they are on a domestic tour to California in April of 1985. In 1984, President John Wilson made a historic decision to admit women to the university. Such a decision had a strong and positive impact on the music department, especially in how it affected the choral program. We finally actually had altos and sopranos. The first full class of women came in the fall of 1985. Gordon Spice, responding to the needs of the time, founded the University Chorus. What has always attracted singers to Gordon Spice as a professor is not just his excellence as a teacher and a choral director, but also his friendliness and sociability. For many years, an informal get-together in the fall at Skylark helped everyone get acquainted and have a little fun together. Then the goodwill carried over into serious music making. Doc's boys were growing up and getting to know the members of the choral groups, some of whom were excellent babysitters. How much fun were those trips abroad because of Doc's ability to seize a moment and grab a costume. For example, here's Beefeater Spice on the 1988 trip to England. Or square dancing in 1989 with Margaret Pimblett. Or demonstrating hand puppet techniques. Gordon loved England, often taking the choral groups there on tour or staying for the spring term to teach a course on the musical life of London. In the summer of 1989, he took his entire family there and here enjoyed punting on the River Avon in Stratford. In 1991, the newly constructed Lenfest Center opened, helping to give a great performance space for both the music and the theater departments. To help us celebrate, the renowned Robert Shaw came to conduct the orchestra and the choruses on January 19, 1991. It was one of those great and wonderful moments for the music department, and for Gordon Spice, it was one of the greatest milestones of his career. In 1995, the department honored President Wilson on his retirement, especially because he was such a devoted music lover. Gordon Spice also worked many seasons for Rob Fury in the Alumni College program, both on campus and abroad. Here Doc is meeting up with John and Rob at a lovely spot in England. Of course, to really get away from it all, Gordon disappeared a couple of weeks in the summer to northern Ontario and the family cottage that his grandfather had built. It was a wonderful place to relax, to regenerate, and to spend quality time with his family. In 1992, Gordon decided to revamp the choral program by forming another new co-ed group, the Chamber Singers. This select group became ambassadors overseas for the university. In 1996, in the company of colleague Larry Betch of the Romance Languages Department, the Chamber Singers went with Doc to Spain. Gordon was not always on the directing side of the stage. Here he is in a great shot singing next to Scott Williamson in a performance of Schubert's Mass in D. In that performance, he was also featured as a tenor soloist. 
Another international trip in 1998 to the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary prompted the inevitable student to make the comparison of the chamber singers to the Spice Girls. In 2000, the chamber singer's trip to Spain was succeeded by yet another successful spring term in London. The international tours continued, in 2004 to Croatia, Slovenia, and Italy. In 2006 to South America. In 2006, the music department finally got its own new home with the building of Wilson Hall and a performance space dedicated solely for music performances. Gordon was delighted with the acoustics in the hall. It's the very space you're in tonight. The chamber singers appeared in several different venues in Lexington. The chancel of Lexington Presbyterian Church was particularly special to him for several reasons. After its renovation, it seemed to acquire great acoustics for choral singing, but it also housed an organ for which Gordon had led the committee to acquire the new instrument for the church. So it's not surprising that the last official conducting task Gordon had before he stepped down as head of choral activities in 2009 was to present the chamber singers one last time at Lexington Presbyterian Church singing some of his favorite French repertoire from Claude Debussy and Gabriel Fauré. Since then, of course, Gordon has continued to thrive by teaching history and appreciation courses, all of them very popular with the students, and leading the department with his positive spirit and his ready smile. On the travels and adventures that I got to take part in, Doc always knew when to be serious and when to let go and have fun. And as witnessed by the turnout tonight, he has been a role model for hundreds of us. So let me be the first to say, thank you, Doc. I want to acknowledge one more time the, the people that really worked hard on that video. Uh, Chris Cartmill did the narration. Chris is here. Chris, you want to stand up? Yep. Tim Gaylard. I don't know where Tim is. Professor Gaylard. There he is. We got to put in countless hours, Graham, Spice. I almost hate to sh shift gears right now, but uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the next speaker, um, a guy who needs no introduction here in Lexington, and really the guy who's probably single most responsible for the fact that, that uh, um, I decided maybe it's better that I never did get a job, so I'll never have a retirement party, so he won't be speaking at my retirement celebration, um, Nick Leach. Thank you, Roger. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful production. Thank you, Chris. It is, it's so good to see that you've not lost your gift for fiction even after all these years. That was a <laughs> wonderful, a wonderful piece and I'm, I'm sure that, that it amused the entire company. I'm, 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 I know I speak for everyone here on that. Um, I can't tell you the number of people who have said if you say anything rude or if you say anything that's going to hurt Dr. Spice's feelings, you will have us to deal with after, uh, after you stop talking. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time. And it, <laughs> no, no, it's not going to be that bad. And people, people said, uh, oh, you're, you're, you're roasting Doc. You're going to roast Doc. What are you gonna say? And I, no, 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 no. It's not a roast. It is, I, I love 
Dr. Spice. He is my musical father. I would not roast him. I, I, I have nothing against sort of a twisted kind of homage, but I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to roast him. Uh, before we did that, though, we wanted to pick just a few people um, for whom we thought being able to, to say a few words would be particularly cathartic. Uh, and this goes back, it goes back uh, decades, really. Uh, we've, and we've been told by Gaylord, oh, how we've been told by Gaylord that we've got to keep this short and sweet, and I swear we will. But uh, there, there are just a few alumni uh, who, well, they just want to get some things off their chests. So uh, uh, without any further ado, I would like to relinquish the podium to Mr. Tom Saddam. You know, before you start, let's let's not let you suffer silently and anonymously. Let me bring you up to the chair of pain. Ah, all right. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, I don't know how cathartic this is going to be for me. Uh, I'm thinking perhaps rather traumatic. You see, when Nick asked me to do this, I had assumed that I'd have at least one cocktail in me before I had to stand up here. And uh, I've been sort of, um, we've been rehearsing a lot today, and it, I've been sort of verklempt the whole time. First of all, it's sort of off-putting. I've never sung without someone recumbent behind me, so this is a totally different experience. <laughs> and I, I've never, of course, sung with such fabulous female voices, and this was the first time, other than the five-year reunion that I've gotten that, that particular joy to do that. So I was on a high until I heard Roger talk about five decades. You know, I'd really prefer to keep it to 39 years. That's hard enough. But five decades makes me feel like old farty spice. <laughs> so. Gordon, um, I, I've been given the responsibility to talk about Gordon the early years. And I don't know if this was your plan all along, but frankly, you've hung around so long that those of us from the early years lack the memory to remember anything <laughs> to make fun of you about. I surveyed the folks, and the only things they could recount were our trip to Puerto Rico and the multiple mishaps we had on that trip. We sang in a hotel patio area where the piano was so out of tune because of the salt air that we lost half of our crowd during the performance. We took a, a bus trip to the rainforest and the picnic lunch we took with us caused food poisoning in half of the glee <laughs> club. Our ultimate aim was to a resort, but we were not permitted to go into a resort. Instead, we were asked to look at it from a bluff from afar. And that was our trip. And then the ultimate insult came on the last day. We were standing outside of the hotel and with our luggage waiting to go to the airport. A passenger jet flew overhead and one of the guys jokingly remarked, hey, wouldn't that be funny if that were our plane? We got to the airport, our plane had left long ago. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying Gordon, <laughs> is that we're just happy we didn't scare you off. <laughs> we are happy that you decided to stay after those first couple of years. The only thing we ask of you is that you retire again next year, <laughs> and next year, and next year, because those of us who have returned from the 70s, and, this, and there are several of us, just have found it thrilling to sing under your leadership once again and with all the talent that you've created at WNL over the past 39 years. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, the people call Mr. Bruin Richardson. He forgot to do that. He's a little slow. Yes, he is. I know. I can't find him. And thank you, Atticus. Um, I, I thought perhaps that I would start out with a story about a bucket. Um, <laughs> he had that same look on his face when the bucket happened. So I won't actually tell that story because I don't want to see because I don't want to see that story, see that face again. But suffice to say that I don't believe Doc ever ordered another trip where we had a bus without a bathroom on it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, all of us can say, of course, that we're here today because, because of Doc, and, and that is true. Um, I can also say um, that my 14-year-old, who's sitting back there, is actually here today because of Doc. Um, because... <laughs> um, <laughs> there's more to the story? Okay. Oh, I see. We, um, uh, as, as some of you may know, when I, was, uh, when I was here, I played piano for just about all of Doc's uh, voice students. And one of those voice students happened to be uh, the daughter of our alumni director, Dick Sessoms, uh, who I eventually married. And so my 14-year-old really is here today because of Doc. <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> um, Three things I'd like, to, I'd like for you to consider sort of from, from my memories of Doc and, and, and also some of the real important events of the university that, that were occurring during the time that I was here in the, in the mid-80s. Um, the first one of those, obviously, uh, that, that has already been touched upon is co-education. And um, co-education, as you can imagine, we were the, I think, uh, last of three uh, all-male schools left in the country at the time, and it was controversial um, at the school, and uh, it was controversial with the alumni. And two of the things that, that Doc was really involved in that I think uh, that, that made coeducation really work at the university, one was, think about it, class of 89, many of you are here today, and what other extracurricular activity um, had as many of the women from the class of 1989 participate in it. Um, it was a university chorus. That was uh, a, an extracurricular activity that was uh, exceptionally important, I think, to the success of coeducation uh, at the university, both from 1985 when it began um, through the, the, the entire period of coeducation uh, and in the, the early days when, when we were really kind of finding our way. Um, the second thing that happened was all the great tours that we did and the ambassadors that um, Doc and, and Southern Comfort and Jubilee and the University Chorus were in those early days of co-education to really bring together uh, our, uh, our alumni and coalesce them around the idea that, hey, this is really great and it's going to work. And I think that was something that really made co-education work, and I, and I really thank you for that. I also think that the building that we're standing in is in very large part due to your contributions. When John Wilson got here, and we all know that, as, as was mentioned, John Wilson was a great supporter of the arts. But John Wilson was uh, a great supporter of the arts in large measure because when he got here, there was a great arts program here. It was underfunded. It had a lousy building but it had two great people leading it in Gordon Spice and, uh, and Rob Stewart. And your inspiration, I think, to, uh, to John Wilson is what made him say to my father-in-law when he was out at another uh, university and they had a great place like this, I'm gonna build one of those. And that's, that's why we're here today in this, in this wonderful building. The third thing that I, that I was personally touched by is your um, leadership in the way you allowed us to have enough rope in Southern Comfort and some of the small groups to, um, 
<laughs> get out there a ways and uh, sometimes hang ourselves, but always know that you are going to be supporting us, but that uh, we didn't want to upset or uh, disappoint you either. And what that taught us was, I think, a, a lot of responsibility and a lot of leadership in the same kind of way that people talk about sports teams and the kind of way that you, that you get that camaraderie and that leadership training from that, I think we got that from you as well, and, and I want to thank you for it. Uh, finally, Mr. Robbie Aliff. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Thank you, Counselor. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I represent the late 1980s, early 1990s into the 2000s. Let's call that the kinder and gentler years <laughs> of Dr. Gordon Spice. Um, I believe the word that I've tried to um, find for this event and that I've tried to find in my heart for Doc is transformational. Uh, I believe he's been transformational to Washington and Lee. I believe he's been transformational in the lives of many of us assembled and many who could not be with us, who have emailed me or talked to me over the last nine months about this event. Um, but you know, we sit here and, and Nick is very kind to you thus far. Um, <laughs> there's one thing that's not been mentioned that I think we can't go the entire evening without talking about. Um, Dr. Spice has never met a pun that he did not like. <laughs> um, I can honestly tell you that Mozart has been forever ruined for me. As we heard, Doc has been teaching Music 101 or Music Appreciation at Washington and Lee for many years. And I guarantee for the last 39 years, two semesters per year, the following joke has been told. <laughs> you see, there was a man named Kirkle who was tasked with cataloging all of Mozart's pieces. Mozart's pieces were in disarray, so Kirkle immediately was dispatched to disarray to take care of Mozart's pieces. <laughs> he had the same response for 39 years. <laughs> Um, in my personal life, Doc is a father figure. Um, he is transformational to me. Uh, I was lucky enough, um, I'm not really sure why, to be one of the first um, class uh, on a trip to London for this fabulous course called Music in London. Uh, with us in the chorus tonight is Amy Hatcher and Brian Patterson and Laurie Lyman um, Patty Carr could not be with us. Franklin Daniels will be here later tonight. The six of us were music in London. Only Doc could come up with a program and a syllabus point that passed the muster of accreditation. Um, we went to the London Philharmonic. We went to Les Mis on the London version of the Broadway, and we also went to Billy Joel at Wembley Stadium. Um, that was music in London. Uh, you've been transformational to me. Uh, I am what I am today in large part because of the person that you taught me to be. And I really love you. Thanks. All right. Need to bring things to a somewhat expeditious conclusion because Mr. Gaylord is going to have a stroke if I don't hurry up. <laughs> but there are a few things left to show you that uh, didn't make it into the nice little presentation that, that <laughs> Mr. Cartmill prepared. Um, and I think if, if to understand Gordon's, well, this slide's blank, never mind. To understand Gordon Spice, you need to go back further. So I'm, I'm gonna take you back a little further, just for completeness sake, we're going back just to, oh, sorry. not that far, sorry. No, we're not going back that far, all right. Sorry. All right. <clears throat> I 
When you think of great choral conductors, certain images come to mind. For example, the master, Johann Sebastian Bach, leaps to mind, composing and conducting some of the most sublime music ever heard. Or, it has been mentioned previously, the legendary Robert Shaw, who once conducted here at this very university and showed Spice how it was supposed to be done. <laughs> uh, oh. Oftentimes, all that remains, however, of the great ones is, well, a, a barely recognizable headstone in some backwater Moravian grave. <laughs> you thought I'd forgotten, hadn't you? <laughs> no, I forgot that. Uh, but there is a middle path, ladies and gentlemen, and the quintessential example of the conductor who went his own way, the costs be damned. <laughs> was Gordon Spice. <laughs> Gordon Spice began his musical journey here at Washington and Lee in 1973 in a rather unorthodox way, and you didn't hear about this before. He started as a construction worker <laughs> working on a campus building project at DuPont Hall. Um, at the conclusion of that project, he parlayed that job into the next phase of his career, which was custodian at <laughs> DuPont Hall. Mr. Spice, or Gus, as he was known at that time, was a devoted and conscientious employee. Uh, he single-handedly solved the space problems, dogging the music department of those days by converting the old men's room on the first floor of DuPont into a combination rehearsal room and office. Uh, in fact, then President Robert Huntley was so impressed with the feat that he immediately promoted Mr. Spice uh, to a position on the music faculty and conferred upon him the honorary degrees of M.A. PhD. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gordon P. Spice, MA, PhD. <laughs> A star was born. And it is difficult to imagine the enormous pressure placed upon Gordon Spice by this faculty appointment. To this day, he knows next to nothing about music. It, <laughs> It is widely speculated that his explosive colitis was either caused by or at least exacerbated by this faculty appointment. Pause briefly, check out the cuffs. He always knew that if this model, if this uh, music thing didn't work out for him, he could always fall back on his modeling, that's for sure. So. In any event, Dr. Spice, D Dr. Spice was determined <laughs> to make singers out of these chuckleheads who continually were sent his way. He developed what are now forgotten teaching techniques, and deservedly so, but which at the time were radical and indeed some would say ridiculous theories, such as synchronized yawning drills, <laughs> his kleine Steppe, or Size Really Matters series of lectures. His inclusion of singers of all ages in his ensembles. His insistence on having a mosh pit for kids at every concert. And his refusal to use props or gimmicks and simply let the music speak for itself. In addition to his active work in the music department, of course, as you know, Dr. Spice has achieved near legend status with his incredibly varied and popular seminars uh, to list just a few uh, Lamas for Dummies, <laughs> his Beginner's Origami Seminar, <laughs> that look on his face, I just, it's like right out of Sears or something. That's right, okay. I, and his incredibly popular parenting skills class. <laughs> uh, in addition to teaching, Dr. Spice was very active in various extracurricular activities affiliated with the university. As you know, there have already been one reference to it, the, the Gordon P. Spice Myopia Olympics, which he organized <laughs> and ran for 32 years, bears his name to this day. Uh, his, his work with uh, orienteering for Nancy boys. Uh, <laughs> Most of whose members ultimately have been found and returned to their homes, by the way, will, will, will long be remembered. Uh, and in a bold move for those times, uh, his tireless advocacy with the Out and About Lexington Club was, was nothing 
nothing short of groundbreaking. Uh, in the mid-1980s, for reasons which are in all probability quite obvious to the most casual observer, Dr. Spice basically got tired of men and broadened his focus, shall we say, somewhat, uh, in a significant way. He also uh, renewed some attention to his aging embouchure, but that's really not part of the story, and you can ask him about that on your own at the party afterwards. So now, at the end of a really good run, Sir, we come here together to honor all of the people you really are. Gordon Spice, drinking buddy. <laughs> Gordon Spice, fashion icon. <laughs> Gordon Spice, role model. <laughs> Gordon Spice, visionary. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it gets great mileage, though. Uh, Gordon Spice, fearless leader. I believe I speak for all of us when I say that when we think of our days here, we think of three names, and it is three names only of which we think. The men who have molded us, shaped us, and made us all the WNL men and women you see before you here today, and those names are... George Washington, Robert E. Lee, and Gordon P. Spice. Well, um, Well, I think we're going to gather everyone on stage, the Glee Club, Men's Glee Club, and uh, we're going to do some singing for you, which would be awesome.